uh, Prince Amin Aga Khan, Your Honor Elizabeth Dowdswell, Your Honor Lois Mitchell, Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, High Commissioner, Ministers, Your Worship John Tory, distinguished guests, friends of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, and all participants in Six Degrees Citizen Space. Last year, when this prize was inaugurated at our first Six Degrees Citizen Space, it celebrated and recognized His Highness the Aga Khan, whose entire life has demonstrated steadfast, unchanging commitment to the ideals of belonging and inclusion. It is these ideals which the Institute for Canadian Citizenship and Six Degrees wishes to honor always. And tonight, we are so pleased to welcome his only brother, Prince Amin Aga Khan. It is so wonderful for us to have you here when we present the second prize. It represents continuity, and I am delighted that you are here. This second Global Citizenship Prize is being awarded to Ai Weiwei, who is... Awarded, who is perhaps the best known artist on the planet today. His work has reverberated across the world and has made truly a sphere of the earth that knows no barriers between East and West. What does it mean to be an artist of conscience? For an artist, what does it mean to declare that a citizen should have a responsibility to act? Ai Weiwei is an artist, an architect, a craftsperson, a global citizen, and an activist. His life is defined by intersections. Born in 1957, he is the son of the revered poet Ai Cheng. Exiled with his family to the remote northwest of China during a political campaign against intellectuals, Ai Ching was forced to do the dirtiest of menial labor. Ai Weiwei grows up in the company of his father's friends, who were also banned and humiliated artists. These years would have a lasting effect. As a young adult, he spends more than a decade in the United States and is inspired by the New York art scene. He takes portraits documenting himself in a place that is, for a young Chinese abroad, both liberating and isolating. Returning to China in 1993 when his father falls ill, Ai now has firm ideas about his birthplace and the forces that work there. He arrives back to a China that is going through a tumultuous transformation without precedent in human history. It has recently suppressed a titanic democracy movement initiated in Beijing. This is where he makes his home. The decade of the 90s brings the beginning of Ai Weiwei's subversive expressions as an artist. With his The Black Book Anthology in 1994, he insists that contemporary Chinese art must be seen and experienced. He is fearless in publishing it. The result of this work makes him an icon. He is determined to bring together the past and the present in a way that is political, complex, and accessible. His daring and ironic works give the viewer a chance to challenge current events and political formulas. Ai's courageous commitment to freedom of expression and to the rights of the individual are paramount. At the turn of the millennium, the internet starts to transform relationships. For Ai Weiwei, new digital media offers a space beyond the control of the state. From his legendary citizen blog to his tweets and Instagram, 
He embraces and masters the power of digital communication as artist and activist. His outspoken and outraged response to the 2009 Sichuan earthquake initiates a still deeper engagement and humanism. In the face of government resistance, Ai Weiwei and his team painstakingly collect the 5,385 names of all the children who perished in the shabbily built structures. They also collect and straighten steel rebars from the destroyed cement buildings themselves. Blunt material, evidence of responsibility. The art he makes out of tragedy is of unblinking witness and of terrible beauty. He will not allow individual lives to vanish. On April 3rd, 2011, Ai Weiwei disappears. He is detained by officials and held for 81 days, with two guards standing by him at all times, including while he sleeps. Finally released, he is not permitted to leave China for four years. By now, he is an artist of international repute. The range of his creative practices is remarkable. In London, he arranged 100 million porcelain sunflower seeds on the floor of the Tate Modern, each one individually painted. In Toronto, Ai Weiwei's statues of his Chinese zodiac animals are displayed as part of his astounding show, according to Watt, at the Art Gallery of Ontario. In 2015, he is granted a passport at last, and he sets up a studio in Berlin. Almost immediately, he goes to the Greek island of Lesbos, where he witnesses human beings fleeing desperate situations at home in order to simply survive. It triggers in him a demanding new project. In a year and a half, he travels to 23 countries, documenting the ongoing mass migration of some 65 million people who have to flee their homes. Human Flow, his searing documentary, is the result. Ai Weiwei represents so much of what is human. His creativity and output are astonishing. He is an exile who is at home everywhere. A global citizen who insists that we see what is happening. And that by keeping our eyes open, we never forget our shared humanity. spinning earth because of Ai Weiwei and his actions. We learn the pervasiveness of his courage, which could be seen in the dust that rose from the hundred million sunflower seeds in the Tate Modern's Tate Gal Turbine Gallery as people walked over them. The atmosphere of that courage emanates across continents, across divides, and across our consciousness now in the digital world. Being surrounded metaphorically by the dust of these wonderful sunflower seeds is the way in which we can feel enclosed in the acts of civic courage for which he is known. And certainly the Western world seems to be losing this, or at the very best, there has been a decline in courage, which is so noticeable among our political class, our intellectual elite, and unfortunately, our young. We are failing, and we have failed. And we are making ourselves known by the feeling of the loss of courage, which unfortunately is extending across the West. Therefore, from the East comes a new expression of what courage is and commitment and it is in the person and the work and the words of Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei is Chinese. Ai Weiwei has come out of a culture and a world which is rich, old, resonant, and in many ways baffling. He has created works 
of beauty, audacity, and hope. And he has done this under conditions that many of us would find untenable. How many of us could endure 81 days of incarceration in which we were watched day and night? How many of us could be beaten and have sustained bleeding on the brain and yet make a work of art of that blood? How many of us could go to 22 different countries over a year and a half and make a film about other people's suffering and needs? How many of us could even begin to understand how to motivate your fellow Chinese artisans to help you hand paint a hundred million sunflower seeds? Courage is the first of the human qualities because it is the quality which guarantees all others. Without courage, you have no life. Without courage, you cannot continue living. Without courage, you cannot give the hope for living to others. Ai Weiwei has courage, and he has done all those things. He has done those things for the people who are oppressed, the people who are not free, the people who have no voice. But more, he has done it for us. He has forced us to turn our eyes to a vision of what life, objects, surroundings can mean to us. In Chinese, the word for crisis is wai fi, wai qi. Wai means danger and qi, opportunity. Ai Weiwei has seized the opportunities that came out of his personal peril under which he was placed because he has been courageous enough to speak out, to shout out, to let the world know that freedom of expression, the freedom of the artist, the freedom of all humanity is what is at stake and is what matters. That nothing must suppress this. That a human being is not a human being without the ability to speak and act freely. In the West, we come from a tradition of democracy which began in Athens. And in Athenian democracy, the act of shouting out was an important one. Citizens could shout out in the agora, in their meeting place, what their feelings were, what their opinions were, what their disagreements were. And they could drown out other speakers because freedom of speech has no limits. When you go on YouTube and you see Ai Weiwei Gangnam video, and it looks fun, and it looks jolly, and he's dancing around in a red t-shirt and swinging something. And then you look closely, and you realize that what he is swinging is handcuffs. This is his way of saying, you think you can stop me? You can't stop me. He has always done what he has to do, never thinking about the personal consequences, never thinking about the obstacles, the laws, the dangers of his society. And by that act, he has behaved in a profoundly moral way. No matter what has been done to him, being handcuffed, being beaten, being watched, having his passport taken away, he has never lost his connection with humanity, with his own idea of himself and his own possibilities as an artist. In all the works of art which we admire, there is beauty. He is a consummate artist. He knows how to work materials. He knows how to surprise. He knows how to disgust. He knows how to shock. But all the while, his attachment to our common humanity is there. He is a loyal dissident and a voice of conscience. He is the most influential and multifaceted artist on the planet. One of the defining things about a great artist was stated by Akiro Kurosawa, the great Japanese filmmaker. When I first read this, I was terrified and then became resigned because I knew I will never be able to be a great artist. Because Kurosawa says, to be an artist means never to avert your eyes. Ai Weiwei never averts his eyes. He looks at everything, and he functions as our eyes. 
And out of these visions that he sees for us, that he can be tormented, pleased, or intrigued by, he binds us to our common humanity. He speaks out when he feels he must do so. With the detention of the writer Liu Xiaobo, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature several years ago, he spoke out and said, this does not mean a meteor has fallen. This is the discovery of a star. Ai Weiwei speaks against oppression. He never compromises. He is never silent in the face of power. He confronts oppression with corrosive humor. He makes us feel that we all belong to the same world. He makes us feel that he, under that he understands that we can all contribute, even if it is only by looking, seeing, and understanding. He transcends all boundaries in the different media in which he works. He has taken the crisis which has made an arc over his whole life and sees the opportunity to exercise his own talent as an artist. Ai Weiwei has suffered. He understands what human suffering is. In the most profound way, he gets to the roots of our common humanity, which we all share. We know that everybody in this world suffers, and he is aware of that. He wants to give voice to that. Therefore, his idea of what the world is and how we belong to each other through this common bond is the deepest and most profound expression of citizenship. Ai Weiwei's country has not been very nice to him. It hasn't been good to him. It has not rewarded him in halls like this with honors and accolades. It has put him in prison. It has beaten him. It has tried to make him feel that he is unwanted. But he loves his country, and he is willing to fight for its betterment, willing to suffer for it, and I believe willing to die for it. He knows his country, can be so much greater than it is. And he has the courage to demand more of its government and its citizens. He was bringing truth to life in China. He loves his country's history, which he knows is one of the greatest in the world. I share that history because I also am Chinese. But I haven't been brought up in the midst of Chinese thought and action and politics. But I identify with his struggle and with his acknowledgement of the greatness of that past. I realize how much he has helped raise people's consciousness today in dealing with their pasts and in helping his own country come to terms with its present and to try to make peace for its future. Ai Weiwei touches all of us because he creates art that all of us can see, which we do not need translation to understand. We have the emotions transmuted for us by one of the greatest artists working in the world today. When we look at the work of Ai Weiwei, there are no barriers, there is no translation, there is simply the confrontation with reality, with commitment, with courage, and with action. Ai Weiwei is the definition of action. That is his life. That is his art. That is his gift. To commemorate this prize, I had a medal created by the sculptor Anna Williams, who lives in Ottawa. It shows the Inuit goddess of the sea, Sedna, emerging from the Arctic to pass a vulnerable world to the outstretched arms of a winged triumphal guardian. Because of his courage and his life and art, his commitment to freedom of speech and action for everyone in the world, his steadfast bravery in the face of arbitrary power, I'm asking him to accept this prize for global citizenship.
Bravo, Ian Cannon. So I have nothing prepared to ask you. <laughs> I had little notes, and I don't have them anymore. But they're all gone. Which is fine. We can have a performance in salad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a privilege and a honor to be with you. Um, this is my first trip in Canada the second day. I would never imagine I would have this kind of occasion. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to ask you when you first realized that you could create something, when you realized that you could be an artist. Of course, not, people don't say, I want to be an artist and I'm going to do this. But when did you first create an object? When did you first do something where you felt, I've created something? It takes uh, quite a long time. I'm not that uh, smart to realize there's a power in, in art till very late. Uh, even my father is a poet. Is, uh, but before he became poet, he was uh, a young artist, art student, studied in Paris in the 1930s. Right he um, returns to China, he was being put in jail by a national, uh, nationalist party, for sentenced for six years. So that time he was 21, and in jail, he cannot paint anymore, he become a poet. So that time the jail is much easier than today. You still can pass your writings to, and the friends still can visit him. So when he served his sentence, come out, he's already become very well known as a poet. And today in China's jail, not to say you cannot pass one word out. You even cannot meet your relatives. Very often, if you're an activist, you cannot see your lawyers. And uh, it could be months or years. Nobody knows where you're, you, you de you're detending. So it's a very different kind of situation. So I, I was influenced by my father, basically. And uh, even when the year I was born, he was being um, put in exile. That exile lasting for 20 years. But uh, I grew up in there uh, with him in the northwest of China. And uh, we would never imagine that kind of darkness can, can be over. So he told us, said, we have, you have to imagine you are born here, which is such nice sentence I always remembered. But occasionally, I can see if he has a pen in his hand, very occasionally, it's not almost very rare, he would draw a, a plant or very simple lines. But that very simple lines really touches me because it's like a miracle to see that lines he made on the paper. The paper at the time is very precious. And uh, so that gave me a very strong impression. You know, you, he can be beaten, insulted, but still there's the area, nobody can touch it, which is art. And the art has its own logic, it has its own um, realm which nobody can touch it. So very often, he has, he has to work as hard labor, you know, to clean the 
public toilet, which is not toilet we see today. It's uh, it's in the in the farm farming area. So basically, there's no water or no toilet paper there. So I will not describe this kind of toilet. <laughs> but what is amazing, what I always can remember, and also as a lesson to me is, no matter how impossible to just to but look at those kind of uh, location, and after he his hard working when he comes out that be perfectly clean. He would put a new sand on the on the earth and you know to cut every corner very sharp. You know if you walk into that uh, toilet, it's not a room. It's you know it has no ceiling, but you'll be impressed. It's always like artwork. But the most interesting thing is the next day will be very big mess again. So that becomes some kind of metaphor. And he, he, in five years, he would, cannot really have one day of rest because simply he cannot bear the, the, the work if he stops one day. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain of this kind of public toilet in this uh, village, about 200 people. And they keep them running day after day for five years and uh, cause him one eye become blind and also other kind of physical problems because before he being this kind of hard labor, he's a poet. He really doesn't know how to do any kind of physical work. So this kind of conversation will go on and on, so I'm sorry, you know. It's all right. To, to, on to on. answer how I become an artist. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and I, I got enrolled uh, in art university and I spent 12 years in New York. I tried to make it short. I realized I... You don't have to make it short. I want to dwell on the New York years. So you went to, you did manage to go to university. Yeah, even yeah. Because you, the family had been exiled, you did manage to go to university. No, that's uh, after Chairman Mao died and uh -huh. uh, China first opened this university in 1978. That's the first university opened after 10 years of shutdown of all the universities. Mm -hmm. So I got enrolled in Beijing Film Institute. Oh, you uh, went to the Film Institute? Yes, yes. So this film, which is so remarkable, which a number of us saw last night, Human Flow, I thought, this is his first film. I can't believe it, it's exquisite. It, it has wonderful shooting, it has wonderful editing, it's music, is perfect with it, but you went to film school. You cheated. <laughs> Shame to say that, but I did. <laughs> and uh, I did finish it. My, my part is more exciting, is I never finished uh, university. I, I, I had a chance, so I went to the United States because my girlfriend, uh, she helped me. Her family is in the United States. So I, I later got enrolled in Parsons in New York. And after half a year of study, Parsons withdrew my scholarship because I couldn't really take in the, te uh, the, the test of uh, art history. <laughs> yeah, you didn't I'm, like it? You I'm, didn't like I'm, it or you like didn't want to? I like art history to? very much, but I'm not so enjoyed uh, about Picasso's uh, girlfriend <laughs> and you know, all those things. And, uh, I, and in New York, you don't really need to take art history lessons. New York City is art class, and uh, you, know, you go to all the galleries, museums, you imagine you'll become mm -hmm. one of them, but which I failed. And I, uh, one day I remember after one group show, I took down my works and uh, walked out to see there's nobody following me. Then I threw my work into the big garbage can. In, in, you, know, you know, it's kind of shameful to bring those works back to your apartment, which is already piled, piled up hundreds of works there. <laughs> and then nobody want to watch. I, it's such a funny time. And uh, so I, I, I was quite smart. I said, no, I have to stop doing artworks because I 
I was so passionate. I, I know if I do that, I will simply have no place to sleep. And I have to move out just with my works in my room. And uh, yeah, so I, I enjoyed uh, being a street artist to make a living, also doing carpentry work and uh, house cleaning, babysitting, all kind of works. Babysitting? I did babysitting. Why? <laughs> Little uh, girls six, or little boys? Uh, I couldn't Both? even identify, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't don't testing me uh, because it's a very very uh, serious matter. So I just sitting there, you know. I think it's pretty scary. The children never cried, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> I did the all kind of job. Well, to keep alive, and you spent a decade there. And New York is, even if you're living modestly, it's still an expensive place yeah, to be. Yeah, I would never imagine just one hour away we have a city like this, and uh, I would uh, try to escape if I know that. <laughs> <laughs> you could have come to Toronto and done housework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in New York, even you have a lot of. Uh, it's very mixed the city. Generally, you feel quite safe. No, no immigration officer would knock, knock on your door. But uh, still, New York is not a city for poor people. You know, it's really a city for excitement. So if you walk on the street, you don't feel, you, you, you look at the people's face. It's kind of a sad image in the 1980s, you know, and also it's quite dangerous. Mm. <laughs> Did you feel, though, that, this, that there was a kind of light coming from the city that was exciting that you didn't find in China and it was different in China oh, then. Yes, I, my plan uh, before it's landing, I see that I, I look down on the city, that what I have experienced destroyed all 20 some years of education I had in the communist society. And I think that city, I would die in that city, you know, it's, with that kind of energy, that kind of power. Uh, for young people is, is unthinkable. So I love that city. And, uh, and t till today, I still very passionate about New York City. And the next month, I will have a show in there. Well, that's the, <laughs> the interesting thing. You're going to do a show. You're right now preparing good fences, make good neighbors, that, which the city has initiated. It's not uh, something that comes out of a museum. The city wants you to do these things. What is, what is the nature of it? What is the nature of the, the city <laughs> Uh, engaging Ai Weiwei to do good fences, make good neighbors? Uh, it's, it's the, the project is initiated by Public Art Fund, which is an organization doing um, public sculptures or, or public related artworks in the city. So I had that chance for, um, uh, we have been talking about it for many years, but I hesitate. I, I feel New York City is already a great place. It, it's very hard to really make another artwork uh, in there. And uh, of course, I'm not so interested in to put a work in Rockefeller Center or you know, in, in, those, uh, in those areas. So it's very hard for me to, to really uh, to go back to the city with such emotions I had. But, uh, to, to really think I can contribute something to the, the people in it, uh, which the city, city belongs to. Until very late, uh, I come out uh, idea to, to work with the issues of uh, fences, border, and neighborhood, and all those concepts. So, and, uh, you know, I come from an American poet's sentence, a good, Good friends make good neighbors. Uh, That's the Robert Frost poem, yes. yes. the Robert Frost, uh, very American poet. And uh, I think it's interesting to, to, to talk about this issue and, uh, you know, at this time. And so the city, the mayor, and the mayor's wife, and uh, in almost in every level of the city, uh, really supported my idea. And so there will be a hundred pieces placed in different parts of the city? It will be exactly maybe three, over 300 pieces. Over 300? Yeah, it's be, going to be over five boroughs. And uh, 
Yeah, nobody can really avoid to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's uh, one of the objects will be two blocks away with, uh, from the Trump Tower. <laughs> and, uh, it's a golden cage. It's very. <laughs> it's, I will make sure. Uh, well, I still haven't come to the moment I start to become an artist or really <laughs> like the art. I, I, I. I, I spent years after I come back from the uh, U.S. to China, that's 1993, uh, and... Uh, 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I break my promise, that promise is I will never go back to China. And uh, I did, my, because my father was ill, I thought this is my last chance if I want to go back. So three years later, he passed away, and I still don't know what to do. Uh, so I have a lot of knowledge about art, so I published magazines, organized the first art space in China, and trying to promote some underground uh, movement in China. So uh, I did several years and made an art exhibition, which is like a ground, um, uh, Groundbroken uh, exception called the fuck off. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, Is that it's translated into Chinese? Chinese uh, is called a uh, uh, non corroborate something like that. You know, it's mu much more intellectual. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, you know, Chinese don't want to take dirty words. You know. They only do dirty things. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, even then, I don't feel I want to, to be actively, uh, to do my own work. But only till 2005, the, oh, I escaped a little bit. I, I become an uh, architect. I become a very well-known architect in China. So uh, somehow involved. <laughs> I love the way this. you said that. I just became a wonderful yeah, yeah, architect. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everything come as a surprise in my life, even today. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, it's what an ironic thing. You know, I, you never expect you would uh, walk in that path, but it turned out you are. And uh, I built my own studio. The reason I built my studio is my mom tired of me. He, she thinks this boy may be never be in the United States. He, you know, doesn't have U U.S. Uh, citizenship or doesn't know how to drive a car or doesn't have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, many things I don't have. I, I never married at that time. Was, and, uh, yeah, and then I never graduated from a, a university, which is most unacceptable in family like my family, you know, I think. Something wrong with this person. <laughs> so she's shy to introduce me to her, you know, friends. And one day she really spoke out, said, "Maybe you should move out." <laughs> I I'm very grateful to her because otherwise I will spend days to play poker card, and, <laughs> which I still have the habit, but <laughs> it's just wasting so much time. And uh, so I, you know, I'm, I said, okay, so I built my own studio. After I built my studio, many people think, oh, this guy really can build very differently. And uh, I become an architect. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I got, uh, you know, I even as part of the, uh, to build the national stadium for 2008 Olympics. We know that bir the birds. Ah, uh, yes. That was your yes. concept, and the and you you <laughs> you created it with uh, De Meuron and Herzog, who are yes. among the most the famous architects in the world. And there you are, Ai Weiwei, with no degree from university, nothing, just like a medieval artist, just like Michelangelo. Yeah, a little bit like him. <laughs> And 
And but I that that year two thousand eight we said, I, I I said we quit the architecture practice because in China the architecture is so political. You have to work with the government. You have to work. It's it's so hard to 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 get any project done. So, and by two thousand five something miracle happened. Is something called the internet. <laughs> so. The state agency uh, called Sina, they said you are so well known and uh, you are so uh, have so many opinions. And uh, that time I, I had a lot of interviews in fashion magazines. They think I'm uh, some kind of style uh, or culture commentator. So they opened uh, a blog for me. I said, no, 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 I never touched the computer. I don't know how to type. They said, this is easy. We give you an assistant. And I said, oh, wow, you know, this is, uh, I tried. But after the first day, I typed two sentences, only two sentences um, on the internet. It says uh, something like, express yourself need a reason, but to express yourself is the reason. And after that, I couldn't stop. I, I ended up each day for four years, I would write three block articles. And the next morning, I realized those block articles have been uh, read by about 200, 300,000 people reposted. <laughs> so I really had a, a great illusion. I thought, oh, why we need to dem demonstrate or to organize a party, you know, it's not, it's so easy, just write an article. And uh, it's like I can cause a riot on the internet every day. <laughs> every day. <laughs> and uh, of course, as a result, all my blogs being shut down in the same second, it's in three different blogs. And, uh, and my name can never really appear on Chinese internet anymore. So that moment uh, when I touched the computer, I become an artist, a real artist. I got so excited. And uh, you know, day and night, I was staying in front of the computer, and all the people around me think this guy is really changed. You know, you gave me a revelation when I read something about you said that Chairman Mao never said anything, uh, never gave a quotation larger than 140 characters, okay? And then I realized that tweeting in China is completely different because each character is a word, whereas I'm struggling away to do 142 it's, it's letters, right? And yeah. that's not the same thing. No, you get no. much more as a yeah. Chinese, and the Japanese, I suppose, and the Koreans would have much more as a Twitter because they have 140 words, whereas we only have 142 Letters. Yeah, Chinese uh, use four words can structure a story. And the 140 words, you can write Chinese history. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's not uh, how would you How would you write Chinese history in 140 words? Just start. <laughs> <laughs> I can maybe well, contribute, but you could start. Yeah, since so many Chinese history has been erased, you maybe only need the two words to, to write about it. Yeah, it's a pity, you know, we, we don't have a clear, um, you know, it, with this kind of cens censorship, we don't have history. And uh, we don't know exactly what happened uh, in the past. Is that true of young people growing up? I mean, you have a son who's eight, um, he would be just starting school, but if he were in school in China, he wouldn't be taught your history, he wouldn't be taught anything, before the revolution? Is that, is that what's happening? Is, it being, is memory being erased? Uh, not only before the revolution. And today I see somebody post uh, a image. Um, the officials would study my case, of course not mention my name, as uh, some kind of dissident or foreign influence trying to subvert state power. So they not only erase the history, but they, they really uh, distort the reality. So 
that kind of state, you can see it's very busy because things happen every day and there has to be very busy to just to distort all those information and, and to, to really censor all the information comes up. So most university students doesn't really know what happened in 1989 or you know, culture revolution. They don't know it no, because it's, no. not, it's not allowed to be thought, really. You're not allowed to be rep reproduced. Yeah, they simply know free information about uh, not only history, even by, uh, about the current situation. How can, how, can, how can people live like that? How can a whole nation live like that? That was my question. I thought, oh, you know, I can help a little bit because how can people live like that? But people do live like that in, in many societies. You know, it's not a uh, general condition we can live uh, like us in here today, in many, many uh, uh, places or nation. People have been living under very limited uh, information or, or facts. And uh, that is the condition of how this ter uh, territorial society can survive. Um, without that kind of condition, this kind of society can never really survive for one day. But it seems now that China is in a, a state where there's enormous materialism. People are very, very rich there. They can travel they can uh, go places and see things, and we have Chinese tourists everywhere. So how, how is it still kept restricted? Or is it only restricted to people who want to think different thoughts? Um, actually, it's very hard to answer. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it's not a logical to see a state has established over 68 years still doesn't trust its own people, never let its own people to see a voting ticket. And uh, no freedom of speech, no freedom of uh, press, you know, there's no independent uh, media, and uh, there's no another party there, and uh, there's no independent judicial system. So in the past 30 years, in so-called open up, China become a very vibrant market and also uh, and also labor market, uh, both consuming and labor market. So it, it accumulated a, a, a great uh, um, profit from uh, from doing so, and also it become a quite powerful in the economic uh, performance. But uh, still, certain things never changed, uh, such as the, the, the facts I mentioned uh, uh, before. And the two of my lawyers, human rights lawyers, are still in jail. And many, many of my friends are still being detained without trial. And uh, yeah, I, I always wonder how far this kind of society can maintain. Uh, if you, of course you can control people, but not to give them dignity of uh, individual freedom. And uh, then how can you encourage any kind of passion, imagination, or, or sense of uh, responsibility? Because you, you never trust and, uh, a power the power which doesn't have legitimacy because it's never been um, given a chance for people to, to vote, to give off the opinion, not to even to see to vote, to speak out. So the society is really in crisis, uh, in competition, in creativity, to be creative or to contribute uh, any value to the, to the global, uh, condition. So it's, it's quite a fragile condition, I should say. What you're describing is a kind of fragility that uh, 
that can, can, that can fracture uh, because it doesn't have the integrity of the people who really care about it supporting it. And you really care about your country, but you can't support it, you can't live there anymore. That's an awful, awful thing to have happen. I, I had a sentence in, on the internet during those very extremely, uh, when I was posting, I said, if you start to care about your nation, you're on the way uh, to become a criminal. So that sentence has been really memorized by a lot of young people who repeatedly talk about that. You know, if you start to try to understand your nation, you be, you, you, you're a potential criminal. So which is the truth? And uh, that made a lot of people, of course, scared or with censorship or self-censorship. They start to just enjoy the material life, you know, to, to yeah, this is no question can be asked. Isn't self-censorship the worst thing that can happen to an artist? I think the self-censorship uh, is worse than can happen to a human being. Um, but as artists, that's almost uh, become a, a, a definition if you are a real artist or you're just someone doing some kind of decorating job. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's because the freedom of speech is the foundation of creativity. By protect this most valuable foundation, our society can be can still have a courage and can still have a vision um, exam or political or or values and uh, and those things uh, make a society uh, or make a human being uh, become uh, very progressive in in terms of thinking and developing our our ideas. Uh, the government uh, did things to you like tear down your studio, they interrupted all kinds of things in your life, they confined you, they took away your passport, um, and finally they gave it back. But everything is arbitrary. Everything is, just happens. It has nothing to do with you. You don't have to consent to that. You don't have to say, well, let's have a discussion about whether you're going to tear down my studio or break up my dinner party or whatever. Everything is arbitrary. You cannot live, surely, as an artist that way. That's why you've had to leave. Well, I, I tried to make an argument because I thought I have internet. Even I may fail, but the argument still can survive. So I did. I tried many ways, but till one day they put me in this secret detention, which I I never got really scared, but still, if you're being totally cut off from a reality, that, uh, that's the kind of experience, it's hard to even to, to, to describe. Uh, because you're, you have, you're so lost when you feel your language, your knowledge, your memory doesn't really support you. You know, all your judgment, it, it does not function anymore. And because you're, you're totally uh, living in a condition which is no way there's any sort of a communication. The soldier will just look at you without eye blink, just like this. No communication, but stern at you for hours or days, then that absurdity can really destroy uh, your emotion and your logic. And put yourself in a, a kind of condition, you feel you, you don't exist. You know, it's, not, it's uh, you feel you're so vulnerable only because nobody recognizes you as one, as a human being. So those kind of feelings are, are quite strong. So when they telling me I will be sentenced over 10 years, and uh, after you release, your son would never recognize you. So, and your mom, of course, will pass away. So those things also really can hurting you because it sometimes abuse some relations 
for you to think about your, how fragile you can be. Um, somehow, I don't really know, still I don't know why they released me. And uh, uh, even that's, that morning, I don't even know I will go be released. I thought I have to be sentenced over 10 years somehow. But uh, I got released. And uh, there's no explanation, except they would ask me to, to commit to say my crime is not subversion state power, but economic crimes. So they even design the crime for you and also ask you <laughs> not to say what they have been interrogating you. So then this game become very strange. It's become, if, but this is, this, this more ridiculous is like they play with no rules, but which also is not so scary, but they play with the rules they can change every moment. You know, so then you feel, how can you play with this game? Because the rules just changes when your, your partner or they can, before the, they make a move, they change the rules. So you can never win this game. Of, of course, they, they, they want you to know you're vulnerable, you can never, never win this, you know, this game. Yeah. You um, were able to make a work of art out of that incarceration, and we saw it in the video. You um, made the room where you were kept, you made a model of yourself, you made a model of, of the guards who were watching you, and they look like, you look like stuffed effigies of some kind, you know, rather, rather than human beings. But you were able to translate that immediately into art. I mean, into a, a, a thing that people could look at and assess in a different way than you have lived the experience. Yeah, with this kind of very limited possibilities, of course, I still need a, a challenge of so-called courage, because how can you reveal how you're being detained? This is unthinkable for the, for, for the secret police. But every second when I'm sitting there, I have to sit like this all day. All I think is, if one day I will be released, I will make a sculpture about that. And that's probably the only possible revenge you can have. So I start to count, I start to look at the, the you know, all the measurement, how many, um, tiles, you know, how many, all, all the details, but the room is so plain and, uh, you know, it's almost no, nothing you can remember, but still, after many, many days, you, I can memorize everything. And, so, uh, yeah, at the beginning, I try to, I try to memorize what happened in my life, you know, from very beginning, from every, every memory I could have until, you know, I've been arrested. So I realized all my life, I only need uh, like a week to, 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 to recall all the memories. After one week, my memory is so empty, it's like I have nothing to, to think about. And uh, yeah, I, so I start to remember all those details, traces in that room. Of course, I cannot look like this. I have to really always look like this. And uh, I have to report every move to the soldier standing right in front of me and uh, to see if I have to scratch my head, I have to say, please give me permission. He will, very often he will say yes. Then I start to scratch my head. Then I would say, I finished. So, you know, it's very formal. <laughs> that, that kind of training is really very formal. And uh, so then after I released, I made that uh, sculpture of uh, how I take a shower or how I sleep. Uh, and uh, one day, a police still come to see me every week or I have to go to station every week because I'm still in detention, soft detention. After release, you still so-called kind of probation or something. They cannot do it because they never really accuse me formally. 
as a criminal. And, uh, but still, I'm in probation. And, and they, one day, they asked me, said, how could you remember everything in that room? He, he's very sincere. He looked at me and says, how could you do that? I said, yeah, you're dealing with an artist. <laughs> but at that moment, I sense they are totally giving up in some sense. So they, they know whatever they teach me will become an artwork later. <laughs> Even one day they said, well, we, we realize you become so well-known only because of us. Is that true? <laughs> I said, absolutely true. Without such a powerful nation, how can I become so famous? <laughs> then take them a quite long time to think about a sentence like that. It's, it's true. I'm still very uh, grateful for uh, you know, what I have been facing through is is unique condition. Because you've made it so. Well, I don't know, that uh, I'm not very good even to cope with that, uh, uh, you know, I'm an artist, uh, but at the same time I'm doing a lot of other things. I did too many interviews and, uh, you know, now You feel I, you talk too much? In past, Months, I did over 150 series interviews with all the major papers or televisions. That's a lot. Yeah, it, it can be more than any artist did in their lifetime. <laughs> any, you know, Picasso or Michelangelo. <laughs> Well, you're doing a lot of it because you've made this wonderful film, Human Flow, and that's part of making a film. You have to sell it. You have to sell, you know, when I say sell it, I don't mean that in dollars, although that is, yes, important. That is important too. No, no, this is no, right word. An artist has to make his living. It's the right words. I don't make living through the film, the, all the income will come to refugees or NGOs. That's good. And uh, during that two years. Uh, I only mean that I have a better way to make a living because one filmmaker, my friend, told me, wait, wait, you know, that time I didn't touch film, he said, I said, why you have to make such an effort to go to everywhere? And he said, well, you don't know it. If you make one artwork, take one collector to buy the work, and that's very expensive. But if I make a film, it takes millions of people to contribute a few dollars, then Maybe the film, if it's successful, and uh, could be easily forgotten. So now I'm making film. I experienced it. I will travel to 20 different nations or cities, and uh, sitting like this to repeat this story. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we can drag a few people to to see this film. And uh, so I still think it's it's very important. A temptation. It's not a great film, but it's it's good effort. It's very good effort. It's more than a good effort. It's, it's a best it's effort. It's only a good effort of one artist who who thinks this very important issue. If we see 65 million people lost their home, this is human tragedy. So we cannot pretend we don't see it. So. That's all. What I found about the film was that it showed us many familiar images because we all watch the news. We see people bedraggled walking along roads, um, in boats in ships, on rafts, we see all of these images, but you have created something which is really a story with, with one line in it, which is about the incredible sadness of displacement. And it, ha it has, two, you built it very beautifully. It is not, it's got two wonderful 
uh, peaks in it emotionally. I shouldn't reveal it. I'd, it would be a spoiler, but yeah, the two. Maybe, maybe we should stop here. I saw it right there. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, nobody would. Uh, nobody will go. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. I think uh, they'll still go, but I'm not going to tell them. But it was. It, it brings yeah, we, me we, to. We tell something oh, no, else. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think they will still be tempted. It's coming, it's coming out on October the 20th. Elevation Pictures is putting it out uh, in the cinemas. And uh, I urge you very much to go. It's I'm begging you to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I know a lot of people said, we've seen the image of these four, but we didn't see it pulled together that way. And of course, you're in it. I mean, you could have made a film without yourself in it. There you are, you're barbecuing kebabs to give to people to eat. You're having your hair cut in the middle of the camp. You're, you're talking and playing with children. Uh, at one point you have your own son, little son with you. And so you are implicated in it. Is that the meaning of it? Why are you in it? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. You know, sometimes you, you go to a really good restaurant. While you're eating, the cook will come out. See? <laughs> How do you enjoy the food? You know? <laughs> Very often, I have to say, oh, it's, it's nice, it's great. But sometimes they come out twice. And it's quite disturbing, but still, <laughs> uh, I'm the cook. And uh, uh, those judgment is very hard to even to, to evaluate, you know. So people really should to go to see it and, uh, you know, Will you make another film? Do you think you'll make other films now that you've no, started that? I, the film like this, I can never repeat. No, it's not a, it, I think it, it damages uh, our feelings about how we think about ourselves. And of course, this is not a fiction, it's a reality. All the mm. actors, actresses, or the people have been filmed they are still in uh, extremely uh, critical condition. And uh, so it's very hard to, to, to really to talk about this lightly and, uh, you know, to think to make a film. Even if I know I have to go through all those troubles, I will not do it. I just start with a very uh, direct, uh, how do you say, intuition mm -hmm. started with my iPhone uh, filming. And uh, yeah, that... How much did you film on your iPhone, do you think? I, I, I may take uh, about uh, 10,000 photos, and uh, I don't know, I, I can't, hard to con uh, uh, count how many videos we did uh, with iPhones. But what, what does it mean to you to use an iPhone? You use it a lot. I had, it was funny because about a month ago, I was with a friend and I said that I was going to be coming to Toronto and I would be meeting you. And they said, you know, my daughter was on, my daughter was on a plane um, uh, and she suddenly realized <laughs> she was sitting with Ai Weiwei. And she said, are you Ai Weiwei? And you said, yes. And you said, shall we have a selfie? <laughs> Yeah, yes, I become shamelessly asking people for selfie. <laughs> you know, when you're getting old and all those judgments become different, you know, you see, you see you, you're kind of spoiled. You said, okay, I can't ask anything, so let's do a selfie. <laughs> Which is, yeah, it's some... It's... Do you feel that you will ever go back to China to live? Um, it's very hard to, to answer that. So first, you know, what is China? It's very hard to answer that also. Of course, I, I, I'm, a, I'm still holding a Chinese passport, and my mom is still in China. And, How uh, old is your mom? I speak Chinese. I love Chinese food. My mom is 85, and, uh, but re recently on the phone, <laughs> She said, don't come back. You know, this is the only wish she, she, she gave to me, she said, don't come back. But I will go back, you know, I'm not scared. And uh, I, 
I move out only because I don't want to give my son the same kind of opportunity I, I had uh, with my father. So I think my son should move out. He's only eight years old. The time he moved out is only five. So I think he's, he's a little bit uh, too early to understand what happens to his father. But you want, you would like to live in China. Ideally, that is where you would like to live, not in the excitement of the art scene of New York or of Berlin or Oslo. <laughs> now they've had a wonderful piece. I'm not so enjoy the art scene in, in anywhere. And I can be doing other kind of job. I told, obviously, I can be a cook, I can be a barber, you know. It's no problem. I can have a happy life in any other type of uh, profession and also I still can build and you know it's, it's not a problem for me. It's just uh, and also I, I do care about China but not with this kind of patriotic thing you know I, I, I was I just think the people the 1.3 billion people deserves better living condition and it deserves uh, uh, a better um, understanding about human humanity and the human rights there. So I made those arguments. I will continue to make those arguments. And uh, I don't know how, how strongly it would affect um, the society. So. Do you have any idea how you affect them? Do you ever get any word out of that monolith that, that covers that very strong power, that blankness, really? Do you ever get any idea of it, yeah, yeah. of how you, have, how you have affected them? Their moment, um, you know, when I was released, the government put a, a tax bill, like uh, 15 million Chinese yuan. This is the only case in the, this nation's history ever put a, uh, this kind of tax, a uh, huge member in, on an individual. And, uh, but by law, if you have to defend your position, you have to deposit half of the money to make any kind of argument. So this is tax law. So we decide to make that argument, even that is almost impossible to find that money at that moment. So on the internet, there's a movement to say, we like to give you this money. So. About in 10 days, we gathered about $9 million. $9 million. People start to throw money into my garden. You know, next morning I wake up, it's full of this kind of pink Chinese money. I was so surprised. And, you know, our cats have started playing with those money. <laughs> uh, it's really, really unthinkable situation in 10 days to give the money to a, a person the state think is an enemy, you know, think is a criminal. So in that kind of moment, you have such a confidence of the people. And, but of course, uh, it's very difficult because uh, this kind of censorship, you cannot let your voice hear. That was a moment because the text find me they gave me a window so I still can make some argument, but now it's not possible. But a lot of things are still possible for you, Ai Weiwei, and they will be possible because we want you all over the world. We wanted you in Toronto, and I'm so thrilled that you came to be Thank with you. us. Thank you. For your Just a few very brief uh, words. First, thank you very much for coming and accepting the prize. You, you do great honor to all of us, by the way. Three days ago, uh, the second annual uh, Six Degrees Citizen Space started in this Kerner Hall 
with a, a very moving citizenship ceremony in the lobby. And that night, the great Michael Sandel stood on the stage, many of you were here, and engaged in an astonishing conversation about immigration and justice and ethics with um, all of you who were here. The hall is full as tonight. And then we've had yesterday and all of today four of our great 360 uh, round tables with sort of 400 people in a circle discussing the issues of uh, citizenship. Uh, last night, Ai Weiwei's wonderful film, and uh, tonight, of course, uh, the prize. 4,000 people from 22 countries, uh, a very strong indigenous voice both in the organization and in the presence. Um, we tried to make sure that almost every event, about half the public were, and the participants were in their teens or in their 20s. Uh, six Degrees Citizen Space is a movement in troubled times, uh, in a movement to try to first create the language to fuel uh, a, a discussion which is not fear-laden, which is not about exclusion, which is about ex inclusion, which believes in immigration, in welcoming refugees, in citizenship, in diversity, and in belonging. Already since the first Six Degrees last year in this hall and at the AGO, um, <clears throat> we've had pop-up versions of Six Degrees in The Hague and in Vancouver, and in this coming year, there'll be several more of these pop-up versions around Canada and, and throughout Europe, and perhaps in the United States, and perhaps eventually in, in Asia. Um, and I just want to say that but the home, in spite of how international this is, the home of Six Degrees is Toronto. I look at the bear when I say that. Um, it's Toronto for a very good reason, which is there are five and a half million people here, the majority of whom were not born in Canada, and there is no other large city in the world which can say that. It makes it a very special place, not to have all the answers, but to have this discussion in an atmosphere which is with comfort with fear and with the ability to disturb ourselves by asking all of these questions. But it is also a very important international movement because the troubled times we're in are everywhere, including in Canada, no matter how happy we are that we're not quite in the situation of some of our neighbors. Um, so I would simply say, and we would simply say, um, you've turned off your uh, telephones, turn them on, and put in your uh, calendars right now that the third Six Degrees Citizen Space will take place, opening on Monday morning, September 24th, in Kerner Hall with a citizenship ceremony, and will close in Kerner Hall on Wednesday, September 26, 2018, and in between we'll be at the AGO, and we hope you will all be there because this is a discussion, this is a cause, this is a movement, this is urgent in our times to show that there are, that we around the world represent the ideas of inclusion and belonging and are not afraid by the other. Merci beaucoup, Miigwech. And, and now, to close the evening, Dion Taylor, Sharon Riley, and the Faith Chorale with pianist Robbie Butosh singing Oscar Peterson's Hymn to Freedom. The 
that's when we will, we will be free. We'll join in our song and together sing it home. That's when we will be free. Thank you so much.